Do you remember the last day and I got us all on the steps? I tried to herd everybody. They didn't really want to come. When was it, actually? Was it July? It was July, and I have a funny feeling it was either the 7th or the 17th of July. I think it was 17th. It was near the middle. And do you remember they were all sitting up, up here? There down was there, you, and some. There was me. There was Adrienne. Michael. Caroline Bullock. I don't think Di was there. No, she was no, not. No, I don't some, think she was. And Simon somewhere. wasn't there either. And Simon must have been with some insects somewhere. <laughs> yes. Well, they didn't want to come, did they? They didn't want to go, actually. Well, I think. was the party the afterwards you offered where you were getting more crates of gin away. Now, in we go, and you've got to be quiet now, Christopher. All right, we'll do it. Come on, cigarettes. I'm Caroline Hart. At school, I was Caroline Bullock. I was at Dunhurst from 1955 to 1960, and then at Beedles till 1966. But I actually left a term late, so I left in the beginning of 1967. I'm Adrian Reevely. Um, I was at Beedles from 1961 to 1966, when I was Adrienne Moore. I'm Giles Brandreth, and I was at Beedles from about 1962 till about 1966-67, or maybe it was 61 to 67. The reason I found it difficult uh, to actually put the date on it is, as my wife would say, because I never really left. I'm an artist. I think I have to put that first. But this was a bit unusual, because at school, at Beedles, I'd been very much encouraged by the art master, Christopher Cash, who I liked very much and who liked my work. But I was a very childlike, not to say childish, painter. So my credentials for being a naive artist, which I am, are that I failed A-level art twice. I haven't had a, a very career-like career. I've always done some painting, done some research for my degree, um, looked after my children. Father old-fashioned, really, not a career girl. <laughs> I've earned my living as a writer, a broadcaster, a performer, an actor, and as a politician. And in fact, everything I've ever done, really, is what I was doing at Beedells and have carried on doing. My wife reminds me constantly that there has been no development in my life whatsoever. At Beedales, I edited the school magazine, I ended up writing for national newspapers and magazines and being an editor on a national newspaper. At Beedales, I was the candidate in the elections. Uh, when we had general elections, mock elections at school, I ended up as a parliamentary candidate and then as an MP. At Beedales, I was acting in the school plays and I now act, you know, for money in the theater. So. My life is actually entirely what happened at Beedales. I've just gone doing again and again. Well, I, I've had an interesting life, I think. Um, I, I left Beedales in 1966 and I went to medical school. When I qualified in medicine, then I, I did the best I could to, to turn around full circle and do something that incorporated as much arty stuff and it was as least medical as possible. So I went into psychiatry. Um, and so I think that was Beedale's influence for sure. So I'm Simon Laughlin. I was at Beedale's from 1962 to 1966. And I went to Beedale's because my uncle had been to Beedale's. He was sent there by my grandmother who wanted him to be out of London during the Second World War and escape the bombing. And she had very forward ideas about education. And so Beedales was really the only boarding school that sort of agreed with her principles. I'm professor of neurobiology in the Department of Zoology in the University of Cambridge. Zoology is the study of, of all animals, um, including humans. And on my particular specialty is working on insect brains. My name is Di Ambash. And I was at Beedales from 1960 to 66. I've been a classical musician most of my life. And for nearly a quarter of a century, I ran my own classical chamber orchestra, inspired by Mozart piano concertos, because I wanted to play them in a collaborative way with like-minded people. But quite early in the proceedings, I stumbled upon some music by a woman composer, and even our enlightened school had not told me that there were women who composed. So I thought, oh, what's going on here? And started digging around. And I did a lot of research and unearthing and performing of and recording music by women composers. Uh, my name's Alison Ball, and I was at Dunhurst from 1955 to 1960. 
um, and B does from 60 to 66. Uh, and um, after that I became a, a barrister and a QC. I've been doing it for about 40 years. Uh, I started my own set of chambers. I specialise in families and human rights and very disadvantaged people and people who had terrible problems. Um, I'll come to what help BDAS might have given me in dealing with that later. I'm Christopher Irwin. I was at Dunhurst from 1957 to 1960 and then I went on to Beedales, which I left in 1966. I uh, originally went into broadcasting, uh, then I went from there into doing European policy work, uh, worked on long-term policy planning. I then moved from there back into broadcasting, did a number of jobs in the media. I was head of radio in Scotland at the time of the first moves towards devolution, which was an extremely interesting period. I went on and became chief executive of BBC World Television, which I founded. Uh, I'd also been one of the people founding what's now B Sky B. So I've had a big media career. I ended that with going to Guinness World Records, where I ran Guinness World Records for about seven years around the world. Uh, and then after I'd done all that, I began to make my way back into European politics again, which is why I'm now doing European Railways. I did very much like being at Beedale, so I suppose it was important that I managed to get in and to go there. It was rather a nice countryside. You could, you could go out into fields and orchards and things quite easily. It wasn't claustrophobic, which I would have noticed because I was brought up on a farm in the country. Um, so the sort of physical environment was nice and the staff were kind and the lessons were fun and children were a bit alarming. I very much enjoyed outdoor work, which was something that we did for the school, but of course the school gave us the opportunity to do it. Um, it's partly because I grew up on a farm, so I thought that was, I still think that you know, shifting bits of dirt around is real proper honest work, and maybe what I do isn't quite as honest and down to earth as that. I'm Mike Gordon, I was at P. Dales from uh, ooh, about 1956, where I went to Dunhurst first, and then went all the way through Dunhurst to P. Dales, all the way through P. Dales, and left when I was 18. So I'm a professor at Cambridge. I work in the, the theoretical end of computer science and the research I do is concerned with using these mathematical models to predict in advance what the hardware and software will do. An application of this is in so-called safety critical systems where it's really important that they have no errors from the very first day they start running. Medical devices, nuclear reactor controllers, software that runs in aircraft and so on is safety critical. From reading my um, reports at Dunhurst and early ones at Beedells, it seems like I was a fairly mixed up child. Teachers say I was, had problems and so on. And I think the one thing that Beedells did for me was turn me from perhaps a failing person into a, a normal person. So it didn't take me as a normal person and make me a wonderful person. It just sort of saved me from being very neurotic and so on. Well, this is a, uh, a school photo I found in, uh, actually in the loft it's of 1965, and I scanned it, and uh, here it is. It's sort of amazing to see all these people. Uh, there's Mr. Badley. He used to live down in the sanatorium. Yeah, I went to tea with him. Did you go to tea yeah, with him? Yeah, I went him? to tea with him. I think there was a rotor, right? There yeah, was a rotor, and he had the most... Uh, his hands were like translucent parchment. I think I belong to a very lucky generation. We were the generation that actually knew Mr. Badley, the founder of Beedells, the man who, with his wife, conceived the school in the 1890s. He was still living in the school grounds in the 1960s. And I was one of the children who was, on a Wednesday afternoon, sent to his cottage in the grounds to play Scrabble with him. So week in, week out, for several years, I would sit down with this very old man. He was about 98 when I first met him. As you know, he died aged 102. And so I got from him the feeling of the old Beedales. And when I arrived at the school, there were still teachers there who'd been there in the 1920s, 30s and 40s. So it was the crossover point between the new Beedales, that, as it were, is very chic, that is kind of dressed in a Laura Ashley frock, and the old Beedales, which is arts and craft, Christian socialism. 
So there was that combination of the two. There was the, the 1960s, the modern world, the CND marches, the protest movement, uh, flower power, the beautiful people. All that was beginning. You know, avocados were arriving, uh, floral dresses, girls with lovely hair and flowers in them. There was that going on. And at the same time, there was this older feeling that the spirit of William Morris and John Ruskin and Bernard Shaw and vegetarianism still existed within the school. And there was a tension between the two, but I was, even as a small boy, I was conscious of that, and the physical buildings of the school made you conscious of that. I was very keen on the Beatles Library. That was the most wonderful place just to be or to work. It had the fantastic atmosphere. It was a sort of retreat. And the library, just unbelievable. I could sit in there all day and just enjoy the woodwork and the books. I mean, it was my childhood, wasn't it? Um, and so I feel warmth towards these bricks and books. I don't like the changes because simply they weren't how it was. Um, I have fond memories of handshaking. I think that was a good thing. Um, I have fond memories of all sorts of things, but a lot of them were quite naughty, really. I loved going out into the countryside, and one of the great delights of cross-country running was to actually be out running through fields, running through the woods, running round the flanks of Stoner and so on. That was just fantastic. We would be sent out on wet runs and things like that. Um, and to go around the hangars, of course, is, you know, not such a terrible thing to have to do. And, and I think that it was, the, it was really the badly ethos, wasn't it, that actually fresh air and cold baths and so forth was really what made the man and eventually the woman. The school ethos, to me, at the time, um, it taught uh, teamwork and um, being part of a community, valuing your surroundings, valuing other people and other people's opinions, and um, valuing what you could put back and how you could contribute. It, it was, um, it didn't do it directly, but the ethos helped you to be unselfish. Uh, we were encouraged to think for ourselves and to formulate opinions by observing what was going on, testing them and discussing them with other people. And I, I think one of the great things I learned there was that you could apply this approach to anything, not just to science, but to your relationships with other people, to politics, to everything around you. Beedale's people very often knew the right way of doing things, knew all the other ways of doing things, but there was a right way, which was the Beedale's way. And I remember when I left Beedale's, sort of feeling I'd moved from a world which was rational, ordered, uh, sensible, where judgments were sound and just and right, to a world that didn't have that sort of thing. It was quite a cultural shock. Well, can I just say something about that? That whole informality and lack of, I suppose, it, probably actual lack of authoritarianism was something I took with me. Because when I started my own set of chambers in 89, I'd come to the bar and I'd been the only woman in chambers, in my chambers. Um, it had been appalling. I, I had never been in a situation where there were all men. The testosterone was palpable in meetings and things. Um, the way they treated staff and the way they expected to be treated and named was just so and that, different from what I'd been brought up with. And when I started my own chambers, one, we had approximately 50% women. Two, everybody was by first names. There was none of this Sarah Madam and so forth. Anyway, the fact is, and I saw myself, I, I didn't sit down and write it out, but I saw myself doing exactly what I'd been brought up to do. Well, I think, uh, I think uh, the attitude uh, was, you know, we'd probably got set. the key to the right life, and mm. the ideal might be to have a society in which we could persuade everyone else to be like us. You know, the Beedale's way, work of each wheel for all, was, was the right way. Mm. Well. Yes. It was very unrealistic. Yeah, a wonderful vision. It's interesting, I realise now that I take the Beedale's experience for granted. I just accept that's the school I was sent to, and it must have given me things. I think what it gave me was an opportunity to really allow my enthusiasms to flourish. Uh, I was free to do whatever I wanted, and I did it, and it was accepted that you could do it. So I think having been to Beedale's, I assumed Anything was possible.